and let's break the ice together. We warmly welcome you to this policy session organized by the Malabo Montpellier panel. As you come in, can we break the ice together? I would like you to head to the chat and drop a quick message telling us your name, your organization, and where you are joining us from. So we network with each other in the chat. I am Lai Butake, Director of Communication <coughs> Outreach for Academia 2063, and I am joining from Dhaka, Senegal. As you all know, our theme for today is climate finance for food systems transformation. And as always, we are looking forward to a very rich and insightful conversation, looking forward to your contributions as we continue to unpack the findings and the lessons from the Malabo Montpellier panel's 11th report on climate finance themed adapt policy innovations to unlock climate finance for resilient food systems in Africa. We are providing simultaneous interpretation in English and French. Please click on the interpretation button at the bottom of your screen if you need it and, shoot and select the appropriate language track. And we are live streaming on our YouTube channel. At any point during this one hour conversation, I know one hour is not a lot of time. Uh, we must be burning with the contributions we have to make. But within this one hour, please head to the Q&A chat. If you have any contributions, observations, or questions, drop them in the Q&A chat, and hopefully we'll have time to bring them to the floor. Without further ado, I will now welcome to the stage our moderator for today's session. She's a member of the Malabo Montpellier panel and head of the Agro-Food and Trade Markets Division at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD. Please welcome Dr. Leanne Jackson. Thank you so much for that welcome. I'm so pleased to be here. Um, this kind of event is very important as we know that sharing success stories and learnings is going to help us all when we wanna to move towards food systems that are also contributing positively to food, to climate adaptation, climate mitigation, and all the challenges that we're facing um, right now around agriculture and food. So I'm very pleased to be here. We have one hour. Um, the run of the show is, I'll pass the floor in a minute to Dr. Badian, who's the executive chairperson of Academia 2063. And he'll give us some short, introductory remarks setting the stage. And then we have um, a whole panel of experts who I'm hoping to draw out um, in this moderated discussion. Like I said, we have one hour, so we'll try to keep um, keep interventions short. Um, for the panelists, if you want to intervene to comment on something that you've just heard a previous panelist um, raise, just raise your hand and I'm happy to, to shift gears on my side to make sure that we have an exchange that is meaningful for everyone. Um, and then we'll carve out five minutes right before the end of the hour to have some concluding remarks by Dr. Sabadogo, who's the Managing Director of Ac Academia 2063. So with that, I'll pass the floor over to you, Usman. Um, looking forward to hearing your opening. Thanks. Thank you very much, Eliane. Uh, thank you for taking time and uh, joining. Uh, thank you to all those who have made time uh, to be part of this session. So welcome to all of you um, to uh, Academia 2063's special event uh, under the Malabo program. We are talking about uh, climate change. And as you know, um, we should rather be talking about climate crisis uh, it used to be climate change when we were running the research to predict what we expected to happen uh, to uh, food systems, to agriculture, and the world in general. I can remember the models and the projections of the 80s and 90s. Um, they were expecting things to look the way they are now uh, around 2050, some actually all the way to 2100. We are already in the middle of what we expected to happen 50, 25 to 75 years from now. So it's, it's huge, uh, it has real costs. Climate change is not something that's happening in the atmosphere above us. It is something that's happening in our homes, on our farms, on our streets, in our offices. Uh, it's happening everywhere. And the costs are staggering. Just in the United States, the Federal Emergency Management Agency is projected to run out of funds and it has more than $5 billion a year just responding to uh, extreme weather events. 
And we're not talking about other things that are happening around um, in terms of uh, the heat, the health cost of that, uh, the um, um, uh, reduced productivity in the economy because uh, um, plants do close. Uh, this is just huge. So understanding the cost implication of climate change and carrying out the type of mitigation and for African countries, more importantly, the adaptation measures to reduce the cost of climate change and find new ways of operating, growing our economies, living normal livelihoods in the context of a rapidly changing climate is more than a priority. And for that, you will need resources to craft the program, to develop the methodologies and the tools, find new institutional innovations, uh, new lines of producing better, eating healthier, and so on and so forth. So how an economy, a country, a society manages to deliver and um, uh, operate and implement all these programs for us to live a normal life and continue to prosper in the context of a changing climate is a huge priority and an emergency indeed, very urgent. So thank you for this event and for our colleagues and friends from the different countries present here. Uh, of course, for our colleagues from MOE, uh, for NERWA, we're expecting from Minagri as well. So thank you for joining us and I return back to you, um, the uh, floor, uh, Lian, and thank you again for accepting to be here for us and with us. Thank you to all and uh, wishing you all very productive deliberations. We're looking forward to the outcomes of this event. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you so much, Usman, for those opening remarks. Um, I'm going to try to make sure that uh, everyone gets a chance to speak, um, but uh, the, the names on my screen keep shifting a little bit. So um, like I said, if you feel like you have something that you really need to interject, raise your hand, and I'll make sure that you have a moment to, um, to share with us your insights. So the, the project for today is um, a sharing of experience. Um, we would be really great if we could have speakers who have joined us um, comment on how African countries can strengthen the mobilization of climate finance. And I think what's particularly interesting is success stories. Of course, we also wanna hear about what the challenges are, um, but we're interested in um, what's worked and what kinds of things have contributed to making things work. So if I could maybe kick it off um, by bouncing a question to our expert from Rwanda, um, Ms. Emily Uwase, are you on the call with us? Great, great to see you. So just a quick introduction. Um, Ms. Uwase is a climate finance expert with Rwanda Green Fund, Fanerwa. And um, it's important, I think, to, to take a minute to recognize that despite all the challenges that Rwanda faces with the topography and landscape, um, Rwanda is increasingly acknowledged across Africa for developing a green growth brand um, and also has been really exemplary in mainstreaming climate change concerns into development plans and budgets. So I wonder if you could comment on this, um, how you see that um, success has been built from Rwanda's perspective and maybe um, if you have any insights on some of these coordination challenges that people talk about because we know we're cutting across lots of different ministries and this coordination challenge is something everyone's facing in this space. Thank you, over to you. No, thank you so much, Dr. Lee, um, and thank you for the warm welcome. Uh, my name is Emily, like you said, and uh, I'm the climate finance analyst here at the Rwanda Green Fund, also FONERWA. So FONERWA is the French acronym for Fond National Rwanda de l'Environnement. So the, meaning the same thing in French and English, yeah. So um, at the Rwanda Green Fund, our main mandate is to mobilize resources um, for climate change. So in mobilizing resources, really how we started is um, was targeting my uh, international climate funds. So mainly the CIF, Climate Investment Fund, the GCF, the JEF, and Adaptation Fund. And what you we re quickly realized is that uh, the money from these funds, first of all, the envelope was so relatively small, so usually 20 to 30 million dollars, but also the amount of time it takes us to access the fund was really taking more time that, than we needed, um, realistically speaking. 
So I can maybe give an example for the climate investment fund. So they put out, um, ex, uh, they call for countries for to put out expressions of interest um, in one of their programs. So Rwanda applies and submits their expression of interest. So after that, you know, the money doesn't come directly. You know, we have to have a scoping mission with the MDBs. We have to have a joint mission. We have to write the investment plan. The investment plan, each project in the investment plan has to be reviewed by the CIF board. And then finally, we can get to the disbursement of the money. So from the expression of interest to the actual money disbursement, usually it's two to three years. And then the envelope ends up being 30 million uh, US dollars. So working like that really has was kind of frustrating for us and really ineffective. So what we decided to do um, starting last year is to really switch our business, um, uh, like I can say, uh, business way of working. So we came up with two large investment plans. One in sustainable cities. Uh, under that was in, uh, renewable energy and um, transportation. And one in climate smart agriculture. So with sustainable cities, we're working with MINAFRA, Minister de l'Infrastructure, and then with the Climate Smart Agriculture Investment Plan, we're working with MANAGRI, which is the Ministry of Agriculture. So with both investment plan, we're like, how about we consolidate? We have the NDC, and we also have our green growth climate resilience strategy, which is pegged to the Vision 2050, our long-term uh, green strategic growth. So we're like, how about we consolidate, really send it together, streamline all projects in both investment plan, and really see how we can streamline the project to have maximum impact. Because the way we are mobilizing funds, you know, project by project, being scattered, not talking to each other, not feeling into each other was not the, the best way of going about it. So I know you said not just challenges, that's the challenge we've had, but also share some of the success stories. So the, it's been very well received. We're um, premiering both investment led at, at COP28. And that's when we're really um, even going to the uh, bilateral partners, but also uh, multilateral partners and saying, hey, DFIs, you know, it's been such a specific way of catering to your um, uh, kind of you, what you wanted, but this is what is follows Rwanda's uh, long-term strategy. And this is our investment plan and it has a whole government approach. So can we use this as a way of really mobilizing resources at speed and at scale? So that's what we've been doing. I'll stop there and um, yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, you set us off on a great track, also highlighting the, these challenges around the size of the money that you were able to get before you had the strategic plan and the amount of time it was taking to get a, a critical mass of finance to be able to move in the direction that, that you were hoping to. So that's a great kickoff. Um, could I switch um, gears a bit and invite our colleagues from Vietnam to take the floor? So first I have Dr. Apollinaire um, Gnanvi, who's the Director General of the National Environment and Climate Fund. Um, again, I just remind people that we do have interpretation um, today. Uh, Dr. Navi, are you with us? It doesn't seem to be the case. Or Dr. Sosu, I think you logged on when I, um, when I first started. Oui, je suis en ligne. OK, bonjour. <laughs> je vais essayer peut-être en français aussi. Je, I apologize. <laughs> C'est pas, pas tout à fait facile pour moi, mais est-ce que je peux, peux vous poser la question? Que sont les, les innovations les plus cruciales au niveau institutionnel et politique que vous aimeriez souligner? Et um, anything else you'd like to draw attention to from the experience of Bénin? Did you hear me? Me, 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 me? Merci. Merci. Oui, j'entends je, je, très bien. J'ai bien entendu. Et mer, merci beaucoup. Et je voudrais déjà vous remercier pour, avoir, pour nous avoir associés à ce webinaire qui, qui traite d'un sujet qui est vraiment d'actualité. Je voudrais dire que le Bénin ne reste pas en marge du climat. Et le Bénin a pris quand même assez de dispositions pour euh, assainir 
ton cadre national pour l'action environnementale et climatique. Et dans ce contexte, il y a eu un cadre législatif qui est renforcé et qui se renforce d'année en année et pas des dispositifs qui sont contraignants quand même au profit des initiatives de préservation de l'environnement et de lutte contre le changement climatique. Euh, quand vous prenez nos tests, quand vous prenez nos différents tests déjà dans notre constitution, euh, il y a un article qui, déjà euh, dans la loi fondamentale, qui donne le droit à un environnement sain à un environnement durable et le droit à la défense et à la protection de l'environnement. Ça, c'est un article de notre Constitution, c'est l'article 27 de la Constitution du Bénin. Et c'est déjà inscrit dedans que euh, l'environnement doit être vraiment pris en compte. Nous avons aussi des lois et des décrets qui ont été fixés, des lois pour protéger euh, les, les forêts et autres, les lois sur les changements climatiques en République du Bénin et ça permet de prendre des mesures de riposte, d'adaptation et d'atténuation conformément aux dispositions spécifiques des instruments juridiques qui existent, tant au niveau national qu'international. Euh, nous avons d'autres décrets qui ont été pris et je voudrais d'ailleurs donner un exemple. Il y a par exemple un décret de 2001 qui fixe les normes de qualité de l'air en République du Bénin. Nous avons un décret qui porte obligation d'importer des véhicules automobiles équipés de peaux catalytiques. Ça, c'est des décrets pour euh, protéger contre les nuisances et, au niveau des véhicules à essence, des véhicules neufs importés. Ça, c'est pour donner ces exemples. Et quand nous prenons le cadre politique, au niveau du Bénin, et on sent une volonté manifeste des gouvernants d'amener le pays à jouer efficacement son rôle aux côtés de ses pairs au niveau de l'action climatique. Et nous avons un document, le document de stratégie, le plan d'action environnementale qui a été élaboré et qui est en train d'être mis en œuvre. Et nous avons aussi euh, dans le PAG, PAG qu'on appelle programme d'action du gouvernement, euh, un axe qui est consacré euh, au bien-être et à la préservation de l'environnement. Nous avons d'autres documents de stratégie qui prennent en compte l'environnement aussi, le plan national de développement agricole, euh, le développement qui prend en compte l'environnement aussi. Et quand je viens au niveau du secteur agricole dans lequel moi je suis le plus, euh, nous avons tout récemment élaborer un document de stratégie sur la biodiversité. Et dans nos documents, tous les documents de stratégie aujourd'hui qui se font au niveau du secteur, et la biodiversité est insérée avec les actions climatiques pour en tenir compte. Je voudrais aussi préciser que le Bénin aussi va loin. Et actuellement, nous sommes en train de mettre en place des lycées agricoles et l'élaboration des curricula de formation est en cours. Et en termes d'éducation, euh, la, la, la biodiversité et les changements climatiques, l'agroécologie, sont en train d'être inclus comme module de formation au niveau des curricula qui sont en cours d'élaboration. Et pour tenir dans tout ça, je voudrais dire que le Bénin dispose d'un fonds, FNEC, Fonds national de l'environnement et du climat, et qui finance les différents projets et qui gère tout ce qui est ressources pour l'environnement et le climat à notre niveau aussi ici. Donc voilà ce que je voudrais dire pour commencer et pour parler un peu de l'expérience du Bénin en matière de changement climatique. Merci beaucoup pour votre intervention et avec tous ces bons exemples, avec les, les nouvelles institutions, les nouveaux lois, le, le nouveau euh, façon d'éduquer les, les jeunes. Alors, tous les bons exemples de succès. Alors, je passe maintenant à Malawi. Um, here, I think we have three experts with us on the call today. I have Mr. 
Musopol, the Director of Ministry of Agriculture. I have Professor Nkwam Bisi from Malawi University of Science and Technology. And I believe also Dr. Elias Ngulande, the former governor of the Malawi Central Bank. So lots of rich experience here. Um, could I first pass over to Mr. Musopol um, from the Ministry of Agriculture um, to share with us your views on some of the success stories that you've observed in recent times in Malawi and navigating these um, climatic challenges in food and agriculture. Maybe I missed saw. Um, I did see that Professor McCombizi was on online as well. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, yes, I'm here. I pass so the I was... to you. Yes, I'm David Nkwambisi. Uh, the director of Mass Institute of Industrial Research and Innovation. And uh, I've been asked to share with the participants to accelerate financing in the food systems. So my quick point is that the first thing I think we need to understand the actors that are working in the food system, as well as those that are working in the financing and see the synergies or the challenges that these actors are, are, are having. Secondary, I think, is to understand the country needs, but also linking to their development goals, uh, because not all financing models can address individual country requirements. Uh, thirdly, I think, is the role of the universities. We've seen a lot of advanced countries uh, using universities to support their development goals. Uh, universities in Africa needed to come up with the proper training programs that are addressing the needs of the government as well as the, the, the communities. But I think if we also champion the industrialization agenda at the continental level, it might allow us not to depend more on the external uh, uh, financing. And maybe we can also use the locally generated alternative sources of, of funding uh, to support our interventions. Uh, maybe another point that I could raise here is to see how we could start what we call grassroots industries. These are industries building on the potential of women and the youth so that they can result in generating uh, uh, money or funds to support their local interventions, especially if we target the adaptation uh, line. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor. Could I just follow up with a question? I'm wondering if you could say a couple of remarks about what specific challenges you think are um, in terms of improving finance for some of these um, less yeah, yeah. serviced groups like women and smallholders and youth. Um, where do you think the bottlenecks are? So the main bottleneck that we have that the, the approaches and methods that are being used to apply in the climate financing arena. Uh, most of things, most of uh, people in developing countries, they don't understand them. And so, uh, secondary, when these opportunities are available, it takes time for the communities, especially the youth, to get the, the benefits. It's like they, they prefer large institutions rather than the local level institutions. So maybe what we can do is to develop local level climate financing models or methodologies using on the indigenous knowledge so that these can then be upscaled to link to their global frameworks. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Again, a good comment on this um, challenge of scaling up um, to, to have a critical mass of finance to um, catalyze some of the change we need. Um, I think I saw Dr. Elias Miglande from the, the former governor of Malawi Central Bank also on the call. Um, if you are, could you um, maybe take the floor and tell us what are some of the solutions you have to help improve access to um, these groups that are less advantaged? Um, uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to this forum. Um, one of the uh, challenges I think has already been pointed out by uh, my professor there, um, and it has to do with how to get uh, local models that are acceptable to the less privileged. Uh, here that what has been happening is we've been using uh, microfinancing models and those don't, uh, don't really, are not scalable. Uh, you cannot impact 
um, a large number and, and then you cannot have uh, adequate financing. I, I like what um, the speaker from Rwanda uh, outlined and, and I just checked in our case, uh, blended finance is a very uh, nascent thing for Malawi. And there's only one fund really that has been set up and only set up uh, some two years ago uh, with the target um, uh, financing level of 35 million, which I would say is quite small uh, when you consider the problems that we are facing uh, in Malawi. One of the major uh, challenges I think for Malawi is actually energy um, availability, access to energy and particularly um, energy for, for domestic use. Uh, this is what is posing the greatest challenge uh, in Malawi uh, to climate uh, uh, solutions, because whatever solutions are being put together, uh, they are actually running head on uh, with the access to energy, uh, particularly the domestic energy. And you find that uh, we seem not to be winning uh, because the energy requirements of the country are just so enormous uh, compared uh, to what is being offered. Um, so energy solutions are, are one of the things that would, uh, that would help, uh, help uh, us deal with uh, uh, climate challenges. A few of the commercial banks have taken this up. They are trying to bring uh, climate smart agriculture to support climate smart agriculture. And the government has also uh, done quite a lot because they're trying to modernize uh, the agriculture that we practice in Malawi because uh, hitherto it's been really smallholder based and, and really with very little value addition and very little processing. Uh, so what is being done now is to try and uh, add value uh, to the products that come from the agricultural sector. But the biggest challenge is definitely access to finance. And we don't have a lot of solutions uh, that have been uh, put together. Uh, we used to have in the past a very successful uh, agricultural support system on the financing side, because we actually had a commercial bank that was, um, uh, that, that was just targeting the agricultural sector. At the moment, we don't have that, naturally because agricultural type of loans uh, tend to carry a higher risk because most of our agriculture is rain fed. So the projects that I've spoken about, which I'm sure I, I think our colleague, uh, Dr. Betty is going to, uh, to speak more eloquently about, um, these types of agricultural methods are now trying to move out of of a reliance on rain-fed agriculture, which uh, has really played havoc with the uh, lending sphere uh, for commercial banks. So for now, uh, those are the uh, few comments that I can make. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your reflections. And I think I'll pass straight away to Dr. Betty Chinyamu Nyamu, who's the CEO of NASFAM. Um, would you like to pick up on any of the comments that we just heard? Um, from Dr. Mulande. Um, yes, thank you uh, very much. And thank you also for the invitation to be, um, to join in this very interesting discussion. So I would just like to go straight to, to where Dr. Ngalande has, um, has, has left off and to start with saying that uh, we know that uh, smallholder farmers and particularly female farmers are bearing the brunt of uh, climate, the impacts of climate change. And uh, in Malawi over um, the last uh, decade, we have indeed, um, particularly within the agriculture sector, been greatly affected with uh, frequent floods or droughts and sometimes both happening in one season. Recently, we are affected uh, by Cyclone Freddy where over 2 million uh, smallholder farmers lost either their crops or their livestock, and a total of um, over 180,000 hectares 
was also uh, of crop was, was destroyed. So uh, what um, we have been looking at as a government and also as stakeholders working in the sector is uh, looking at building resilience of uh, these vulnerable um, communities, particularly the smallholders that, uh, you know, th that need to move from um, uh, subsistence farming to more commercially oriented farming with that understanding that uh, the smallholder farmers, uh, women inclusive, they are not only producing for food, they depend on agriculture for food, in the, yes, but they also depend on agriculture to get the income for all their other needs. So um, what with climate change, they need to build resilience that they are able to continue farming and continue being productive in spite of uh, you know, the um, very uh, irregular weather patterns that they're experiencing has been important. So we have seen that um, as part of building the resilience, the government has uh, is promoting more projects that empower the uh, smallholder farmers and particularly women for them to be able to produce uh, higher yields uh, from their smaller fields, but also to go beyond subsistence in the sense of providing markets and do, uh, doing value addition as, as uh, Dr. Angalande has said. Another model that uh, we have also seen working very well is uh, you know, anchor farms, using other anchor farms um, as well as other inclusive business models that integrate these small uh, farmers or small agripreneurs in bigger corporate um, business models so that uh, the small farmers and the small um, agripreneurs are able to access markets that the bigger corporates uh, uh, do have access to. And in the same way, they're also able to access financing indirectly through these bigger corporates. So these models that are integrating the smaller farmers in, in these larger uh, uh, cooperatives have actually, um, we have seen them improving access to finance. We've seen them improving um, access to technology, access to mechanization and other things that the small farmers need in order to improve um, their productivity, but also just be able to adapt and mitigate the impacts of climate change. Another uh, point that I would like to, to talk about in terms of access to finance is also um, another initiative that we've seen working very well in Malawi, and that is village savings and loan schemes, where women particularly have been able to mobilize their own resources to save and be able to invest in their farming. And as NASWAM, what we're doing now is working on building on these uh, um, community level village savings and loan schemes to link them to formal credit institutions so that um, with the savings that the women have been able to mobilize, they can access, uh, they can use them, uh, use as, as collateral to finance, to access uh, bigger financing from formal institutions. In other instances, we're also using that to assist the women to access a different kind of um, input um, acquisition uh, options. So in some cases, it means that they're able to put that as a deposit for them to pay, um, to get access the inputs for the upcoming rainy season. So um, I think this is something that is also happening in other areas where, you know, village savings and loan schemes. But I think what we found interesting is how we can build on these and link them to formal structures so that they actually get uh, a lot more benefit than if they're just doing it at, at a small scale, as it were. Let me leave it there for now. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, could I um, maybe ask one follow-up question? Because um, some of my colleagues here are working on questions around productivity in agriculture and trying to boost productivity. And you said this is one of your key strategies is to help um, some of the smaller farmers and the women farmers to produce with higher yields. Do you have um, insight into what types of things are working in that area? Or maybe you're not, that might be a question that's taking us in a direction that's not super useful for you, but I'm curious myself. <laughs> Um, yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, 
In Malawi, the biggest, uh, apart from, you know, generally improving the access to factors of production, which means land, labor, and capital, what we found also having a big impact is access to technology. So um, where farmers have been uh, not only given access, but also being trained on how they can use various technologies and modern ways of farming so that they can increase their yields. And we have seen some improvements, I think just by changing the way that they grow their groundnuts from you know, planting a single row to just teaching them that they can plant two rows on the same ridge and you find that the yields double. So uh, there's a lot of um, just new technologies that are going on and also working with research institutions. I think uh, Professor Nkwambi is from MAST. There's some work that we were doing with them through the Center for Agriculture Transformation, where new technologies are being developed. And we are, uh, as a farm organization, taking those technologies to the farmers, making sure that they understand uh, by being involved, not only in uh, after the technology has been developed, but even during the development of that technology. So they are part and parcel of it, part and parcel of that technology. And when the technology is eventually passed, the farmers are already familiar with it. The uptake is uh, much higher, and they can you know understand why they have to do it, and it's easier for them to implement such technologies. Great, thank you. That was um, a great answer and also reminded me about the importance of not just the technology itself, but all the enabling conditions around making sure the technology can get used to get the, to get the um, yield gains that everyone is looking for in this space. So I believe that um, Mr. Redwell Musapol, who's the director of the Ministry of Agriculture, was able to connect. And I was hoping you might um, share with us your reflections on um, concrete examples from your experience um, in Malawi uh, about success where access to finance was facilitated or any other success stories that you'd like to highlight. Over to you if you can if you can unmute yourself and um, and join the call. Hello. Hi. How are you? Over Fine. to you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you. Thank you so much. And the apologies for joining the call a bit later. I struggled to connect straight to um, I think the point uh, in terms of. Uh, uh, some um, successes, examples of success with regards to uh, financing. I think I will point at uh, uh, maybe three, just as an example, uh, but I think we have uh, many more, um, you know, uh, programs that uh, we have uh, implemented or we are implementing, um, you know, uh, related to uh, climate financing. The first one I would want to point at is uh, with the uh, um, support uh, from the um, Green Climate Fund, uh, we have uh, a project that uh, we're implementing with the uh, World Food Program, and we're calling it the Adaptation Fund uh, Project. Uh, primarily, uh, this project is helping to uh, help build capacity uh, within the Ministry uh, of Agriculture so that uh, we can be uh, able to prepare our own um, you know, financing uh, requests uh, to, to be able to access these uh, resources. So we are having a pilot and we're implementing three uh, districts uh, of the uh, country. One of the key areas that we are having to uh, uh, implement activities is in the uh, irrigation and also um, I think supporting the uh, farmers with improvement of the uh, you know uh, application of the, uh, the the improved agricultural uh, technologies. Uh, the second aspect that uh, briefly I can touch on is to also pilot um, the insurance you know aspects uh, with the sense that uh, you know when the farmers engage in agricultural activities because of climate change and especially because of the dry spells and droughts, they lose you know, their uh, commodity uh, harvest in the process. And so uh, the, 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 the pilot is about having to give an understanding you know, their crops 
uh, they would be able to you know get um, some benefits uh, so far there's some uh, you know uh, excitement uh, in the three pilot uh, districts that we are having to um, introduce this you know uh, facility the second aspect that i think i would like to point to is the uh, uh, the building uh, uh, climate resilience um, and uh, like uh, Chirwandi uh, through the global global environment you know uh, facility. The third one um, are the uh, various projects that again um, our development partners uh, um, having to look at the I think the various aspirations of government and the sector through the uh, policy documents are having to support uh, government to implement um, these projects. Um, firstly, I think looking at the uh, the Global Climate Change uh, Alliance implemented by uh, FAO, uh, which uh, has been supported uh, through the uh, European uh, Union. There are also various, I think, other investments uh, through other agencies like the UNDP and looking at the adaptation project, which is coordinated by uh, the uh, Department of Environmental uh, Affairs. So I just mentioned that these are three, these are just three uh, examples. It's not a complete uh, compendium, uh, but we know that the colleagues in the uh, Ministry of uh, uh, natural resources, the Environmental Affairs Department would have, you know, a, a complete a complete uh, list. This is just, I think, a demonstration that uh, uh, there is some, you know, uh, response. Uh, I think from government and from uh, Malawi to uh, help, you know, uh, provide some um, some financing. Having said that, I think I have to uh, also be clear that uh, there is a need, I think, to um, increase. Uh, this pub, uh, public financing um, and indeed financing towards you know uh, climate uh, resilience um, investments. My colleague, I think Dr. Betty, has talked about I think the uh, challenges that we have met due to uh, climate change. There are huge losses that we uh, do uh, encounter. Um, you know to 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 to, to respond, but I think. Um, also be uh, you know uh, a, a, a good a good uh, uh, way to try and be uh, and, and 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 do at ex, what was called ex ant or before you know the disasters um, happen things that uh, you know we can begin to uh, help like the farmers uh, to be able to invest you know in the production. So that in terms of the suffering that they may have to undergo uh, after it, has, it may be, you know, uh, reduced. At the moment, there is um, a projection of, uh, you know, a Nino, and uh, I think uh, the technologies that uh, are, are, are around would be able to somehow, you know, lessen, um, lessen the suffering of the farmers or indeed the reduced production, you know, um, capacity. And so, what needs to be done is, I think, to be able to finance. Um, these, you know, uh, interventions, these activities uh, ahead of time, so that um, uh, maybe instead of having to respond to the suffering, we should be able to invest ahead of time and be able to uh, contain or reduce, uh, perhaps, you know, the level or indeed the scale of the uh, suffering. I think for now, this is what I can uh, say with regard to uh, the examples of uh, say what uh, uh, as a country we have uh, been able to uh, go through uh, in terms of accessing um, the financing uh, for climate um, change. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, highlighting these very important themes about what it takes to invest for resilience when farmers are having to navigate this more complex climate situation um, and needing to be able to adapt to shocks and also potentially transform from the shocks and thinking about how finance can help build that resilience. So I see um, we have about 10 more minutes for panelists um, to talk. So I'd like to shift gears a little bit because I think I've asked everyone um, who's in the body of the panel a question. Um, I'll pause for a second in case there's someone I missed um, who wants to put their hand up or just take the floor. Because what I'd like to do is um, shift gears a little bit and ask you to think um, 
think towards the COP28 meeting, um, which will happen towards the end of the year. And if I could ask each, um, each panelist to give the views from your country's perspective of what the key immediate priorities are as we go into this big um, climate event to make sure that we can actually implement a roadmap that's going to lead to better and more investments for food systems and agricultural adaptation. So I, I'll go in the same order that I did in terms of countries. So um, um, Emily, are you still with us? Would you would you uh, have some yeah. thoughts about um, about this getting ready for the COP twenty eight and what do we want to do to maximize impact in this finance space? Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you, doctor. So for us, uh, in Rwanda, the goal is clear. Um, you know, de uh, developed countries are not meeting their commitments. So that's always the main issue, you know, because we talk about financing. So a lot, a lot of the financing that um, was uh, that's available is not even concessional, you know, because if you look at the Rwandan franc, um, versus the US dollar, it depreciates about 7% every year. So they say that they're lending, you know, these World Bank uh, projects are lending at 4%, but, and, you know, to a relatively concessional term of like 15 to 20 years, but they're all lending in hard currency. So at the end of the day, uh, Africa is getting, Rwanda and Africa is getting more indebted. Um, it's not really concessional once you because they're not lending in local currency. Um, the pool of grants is getting smaller and smaller every year. So commitments are not being met. And that's really um, the, the, how we are going into COP. Thank you. Thank you very much. So a key call on developed countries to um, honor the commitments that have been made in the past. Um, could I pass over to Dr. Sosu, if you're still with us from Mena? Est-ce que vous aimeriez commenter sur cette question de préparation pour le COP 28? Oui, je suis, oui, je suis, je suis toujours là et je voudrais aller sur la même ligne que ma collègue tout à l'heure qui a dit que qu'il faudrait que les pays développés respectent leur engagement. Euh, vous savez, je vais enfoncer un peu le clou et Nous, nous travaillons aujourd'hui pour, pour les générations futures. C'est pour préserver, parce que au jour d'aujourd'hui, nous ne sommes pas encore au même niveau de dégradation que les pays développés. Et il faudrait, pour nous aider à assurer réellement euh, cette préservation de l'environnement qui tienne les engagements, qu'ils mettent plus de moyens à disposition pour pouvoir exécuter les différents projets. Nous demandons à nos agriculteurs de respecter certaines pratiques agricoles au jour d'aujourd'hui, mais les moyens ne suivent pas de temps en temps. Et si les moyens pouvaient suivre pour faire tout ce que nous voulons, et je pense que nous pouvons atteindre les objectifs visés. Merci beaucoup. Um, je passe la parole au panéliste qui vient de Malawi. On avait plusieurs, je pense. Um, so I'd, I'd like to pass the floor to um, any of our panelists from Malawi who would like to comment on this preparations for a COP28. Um, Dr. Nglande, are you still with us? Or Betty, I see you turned your camera on. I'll pass the, I'll pass the floor over to you, Dr. Betty. Um, I guess, thank you very much. Um, just to add, I think ov obviously the issue of uh, um, commitments by developing, country, developing countries is a key one. But I also wanted to bring in another angle, which is uh, sub-regional and regional coordination, where, uh, because we know that uh, you know, climate change is not affecting countries individually. Uh, there are some weather patterns, for example, that affect uh, sub-regions. And especially when you look at where Malawi is, you find that uh, most of the times uh, Malawi, Madagascar and Mozambique are affected the same way. And I think it's very important that we start looking at those kind of sub-regions and look at how we can um, develop uh, programs together as opposed to just uh, going um, as individual countries. But even as um, at regional level, to just strengthen our 
uh, capacities in uh, lobbying and negotiation so that as we go um, to COP28, uh, we are able to actually achieve uh, more and better results uh, by, by that uh, uh, regional advocacy and strengthened capacity. Thank you. Thank you very much for that reminder. Um, certainly those kinds of coordination and capacity building um, efforts are also, um, I can see them percolating up in the system that's getting ready for COP. So um, that's a very good point. Um, Dr. or Mr. Musafol, you see, I see that you have your video on. Would you like to comment on this question about key priorities for the COP28 outcomes? <laughs> Yes, uh, please. Uh, so in addition, I think, to what uh, my colleague, Dr. Betty, has uh, pointed out, and I had that uh, point too, uh, that uh, there is need, I think, for you know, um, the regional uh, platforms uh, strengthened um, in terms of working out uh, solicit of the financing uh, for, for the uh, climate funds. Uh, but in addition to those, uh, I thought uh, having gone through a very comprehensive uh, process of the uh, food systems. There have been you know, uh, strategic uh, alliances that have been um, created. There are networks and there are platforms that have been um, created. I, I, I believe uh, perhaps uh, these would be good um, you know, avenues uh, for lobby, you know, for more uh, funding to support uh, the food uh, systems. The good thing is that uh, uh, the food system is such a broad area. Uh, it could be in any area, area within, you know, the agriculture sector. Could be an area in the environment, area in the, uh, you know, um, other you know, uh, different sectors. So I think riding on these uh, platforms would be a very um, good, you know, um, idea. Uh, but maybe more local um, that uh, perhaps as the a country goes to uh, the COP. Um, a country position on issue of climate finance and it's been uh, put up uh, to be able to uh, drive and in indeed attract investments in the uh, agri-food uh, systems. Um, I thought I could add all the, those, those, uh, those two points. Thank you. Thank you so much. I know I have two more panelists um, from Malawi. I wonder if Professor David you would have a perspective um, from your seat at, in a university. Is there, a, is there an academic yeah. thought around this question? What should come out of COP28? Uh, I think I would, uh, in addition to what my other senior colleagues have covered, but I, I propose for a locally financed transformative which is inclusive uh, covering women and the youth and also bringing issues of uh, our local alliances as well as the capacity building. S if we strengthen a local finance system, we can be challenging the global frameworks uh, because we have practices that we can showcase. Uh, I think we need also to build on those global frameworks to strengthen our own local interventions. Betty, Betty gave us a lot of examples at case studies how partnerships at local level are strengthening financing of institutions. So this is the framework that I could adopt. And I think we've already started these discussions with the Minister of Agriculture here, where universities, the ministry, and other partners are now framing the we're having a little trouble with your audio. Addressed. Could you um, could you maybe repeat your last remark, but with your video off because the audio was glitching. We've just started the discussions with the Minister of Agriculture and all public investors here in Malawi to frame the problem as partners, then jointly understand the challenges or the solutions to those problems. And then if there are some gaps, we might go and link to international partners. So that's the point that I wanted to, to mention here. That's literally advocating a locally driven solution. Thank you. Thank you so much. Also a great reminder about, we're talking about multiple scales and, and we need action across many different scales um, in this area. I have one final panelist. I wanna check with um, Dr. Elias Naglande. Um, are you still with us? Yes, I am. Okay, perfect. The floor is yours. 
Um, just just uh, putting everything together that uh, has been said by my colleagues, I would say even at the regional level, as we prepare for COP28, uh, we should look at regional financing initiatives. I think it's one thing to look um, um, out of the continent and, and look at the, the global um, multilateral or bilateral initiatives, but I think within the region also, we need to do something about upscaling those initiatives that are working elsewhere and seeing how they can apply, for instance, in Malawi. So if, for instance, uh, Rwanda has successfully uh, figured out uh, how to do um, their own local financing, could we upscale that so that it covers a few more countries? And then with appropriate safeguards, uh, for the financial sector. One, one, one of the outcries that uh, I, I hear quite a lot is that as a region, we don't seem to integrate our financial systems. Uh, so that weakens because then everyone is sort of trying to figure out their own way of financing from their little corner. When in fact, if we joined hands, probably we could put up a, quite a formidable fund uh, that could then address some of these issues. So I think uh, these are also initiatives we should think about as we prepare for COP28. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, also a, a really nice point about this question about regional, um, regional efforts, um, which kind of ends us on a positive note in terms of thinking about working together, because if we're going to try to get to these solutions for big climate problems in food and agriculture, it's going to take everyone pulling um, in similar direction. So with that, I think I, I'll wrap up my part of this, which is just to say thank you so much to the panelists for making this such a dynamic conversation. Um, I was really happy to have you all on the panel with us. And I'm now going to pass over to Dr. Mumini Savadogo, who's going to give us the wrap up comments for this, for this event. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, moderator. I think this has been, uh, uh, as you said, a very dynamic conversation. And the subject that guided us here is a very critical one. Um, as you know, at the beginning of the Executive Chairperson of Academia 2063 highlighted the fact that this is really a climate crisis and uh, we are living it and the impact is not only at global but more importantly at local and diverse manner and uh, we see that uh, climate uh, finance uh, for food system transformation is a timely topic for us uh, from the discussion i would like to highlight maybe number of um, aspects. Uh, the first one I would like to comment on is uh, for us to understand uh, the importance of having um, a systemic approach to the climate finance in relation to uh, food systems. This needs for us to think along the value chain of the food systems and also make sure that we, through the system, we develop an integrated framework. We have seen the example from Rwanda, where they have to come out with very integrated framework that allows the application of a result-based approach. And this is something that we see as, as very important and that will uh, help countries to streamline their approach. Uh, it is clear that the project-based approach is far away from the ambitions and from the need and the impact we are targeting. We need to have a programmatic approach, which is based on evidences that help have very integrated planning processes. This will enable us, while exploring the different instruments 
funding instrument alone, either the uh, international uh, frameworks or instrument we are having. Mind you, if you look at the, the share, for example, on the uh, international instrument for funding, we come to realize only one third is yeah, a grant. The, grant, the share of the grant among all the financing instruments for uh, climate finance is only one third. While we know that uh, Africa contribution to climate, to climate uh, in the, as a whole is around or less than 4%. This means that the advocacy we are uh, tr trying to make at this COP, I um, think all of us and the countries uh, must really uh, take at heart the advocacy system in a synergic manner based on uh, the declaration that we, are, we had recently from Nairobi. The Nairobi declaration has given us a frame where countries can really synergize and advocate. But while doing that, as I said, first one is looking in a systemic manner, the climate finance with regard to food system transformation and making sure that we capture all the segment of the value chain. This is very important and put it into an integrated framework uh, with evidences that we can track the impact very clearly. And this will allow really effective uh, resourcing, but also effective implementation. And also at the end, while we have uh, effective implementation, we can together learn our lessons and implement further for better, for better results. The uh, second aspect I would like to also mention here is the capacity. Even when international uh, funding mechanisms are put in place, sometimes at the country level, at the regional level, we are unable to uh, tap into the opportunity effectively because of a lack of capacities, because also of a lack of skills that can enable us to uh, discuss and formulate a pipeline of projects that are really bankable, that can show the real additionality of the adaptation activities we are undertaking and mitigation activities. These needs from us that we continue developing our capacities, analytical capacities that will provide and help countries. And I think uh, we are ready to also support uh, this domain so that we can have a good uh, uh, instrument and tools we can tap on the existing funding systems. Then the third one is innovation. Uh, how do we innovate in the process of uh, resourcing uh, for our climate actions in the food systems? Here, that's what we need to learn from each other. And the example that has been shared here, but also in the uh, MAMO uh, panel report, uh, these are things that we need to uh, share or cross fertilization and also, based on that, encourage countries to really go deeper together. This can be done in bilateral manner. It can also be a taken to the regional economic commission uh, committees level so that together we develop uh, something that is strong. I would like to end with uh, the importance of the regional approach. That's the fourth one. Uh, Somebody here, I think, mentioned the importance of having at regional level adapted funds that can supply our countries and help fill the gap uh, uh, we are seeing in terms of climate finance. And here, of course, I think this appeal is really a point on time. And as we prepare to go to the COP uh, 28, uh, at regional level, we need to organize better ourselves at continental level to organize better ourselves and make sure that we uh, develop a kind of uh, funding mechanism that will really come and uh, bridge the gap. And these, some of these have been highlighted a bit in the um, uh, Nairobi declaration, uh, but I think we can still continue uh, reflecting on them and refining them 
and institutions, uh, international institutions and research organizations like academia and others are really ready to help the countries uh, so that we continue making sure that the, these three, the first one, the systemic approach, uh, the, second, the second one, making sure that we have skill and capacities and the third, the third one, making sure that at regional level, we integrate our efforts and we learn from each other to innovate. This can be take, at, taken at scale and we are ready to do that. And I would like to thank really the moderator and thank speakers from the countries and thank also all the participants that were with us today. And this is a continuous uh, work a continuous uh, analysis, a process, and we invite all of you really uh, to continue doing that, this process of learning, so that I'm sure that together uh, we will be able to break through into some innovations that will allow us to bridge the gap as we continue advocating for international funds and support and building our capacities. Thank you. Nicely done. Thank you, Dr. Savadogo, a Managing Director at Academia 2063. A very warm thank you to Dr. Leanne Jackson for agreeing to moderate this session. And thank you to all our speakers who showed up today and shared all their experiences with us. Thank you to our attendees for making the time to spend this hour today. Uh, we are very thankful to all our speakers for giving us a full hour of knowledge sharing I invite you to head to the chat and visit mamopanel.org to check out the work of the panel and to get a look at the, the full panel of experts. Uh, we have 12 reports published to date. Uh, the Kremlin Finance Report is our 11th report. The link will be shared in the chat in a couple of seconds. Kindly head to the resources page of the MAMO panel website, download a copy of that report and continue to leverage the findings. Follow MAMO panel on Twitter at MAMO panel. And of course, we look forward to welcoming you to all our upcoming events. Thank you for joining us today and have an excellent evening. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>